my father's place, proclaiming Jesus Christ to the world. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. Today I'm going to speak a message called the Blaming God. And I'm going to show it to you from Job. So you can go to Job, it's just before the Psalms, and go to chapter 1. And we're going to kind of walk through Job. I'm going to pick specific passages, short, brief things, that will show you Job's heart attitude toward the Lord. And so, blaming God, I am going to pray, and then we'll get in. Oh, Lord, thank you that you would send this message out so that those who hear it would have their hearts pricked and repent. That's the purpose of it. It's your mercy to them. So let your words come out my mouth and do what you have sent them to do. I pray it in your name. Amen. Blaming God. So Job was God's servant, and so should you be his servant. Now, Job, you will find, trusted in his own righteousness, that is, his good deeds, his good heart. Everything from his perspective was good. And when you do that, you are actually self-righteous because you're depending on your own righteousness and standing on that when you should be standing on his. I'll show that to you. So if you are one who thinks you're really good and you're doing good things and that's good for God and God loves you because you're doing that and you depend on those things, he will bring a test upon you. He will test you with some kind of affliction. It may be illness, it may be troubles, anything that he can possibly do to shake you from your shaky position so you will step into the fullness of God and stand steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in his work. Glory to God. When you blame him and say he is wrong to do it, what does that do? What is this test about? To show you the contents of your heart. If you blame him and tell him he's wrong to test you, then you reveal that you're judging God and that you think you are righteous. And why is he doing this to you? You're righteous. So that's what Job did. Now the Lord began saying that by saying that Job was his servant, the most blameless and upright man on earth, fearing God and turning away from evil. That's in Job 1.1. 1, 1. I mean... This is really quite a thing to be said of someone. But note that God did not say Job is righteous. Upright means he was doing right things. Okay? And so he prospered financially. He had thousands of flocks of camels and all kinds of animals. And he was just very, very prosperous, and was highly respected by many. But Job was not righteous. There was something in Job's heart that Job needed to see. I know from my own experience, there was something in my heart that I needed to, to see in order for me to be delivered from MS and to go on to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I speak from experience. So there was something in his heart that he needed to see. There was something in his heart that stood between him and the Lord, just like there was something in mine that stood between me and the Lord. And there was something in Job's heart that when he would stand before the Lord for judgment, he would be condemned. And it was the same with me unless he repented. And the purpose of this test was for him to see it and repent. So, in his great mercy, he allowed Satan to afflict Job. And that's in 1.11 of Job. 
And it was the only way that Job would see what was in his heart that was wrong because his own self-righteousness had blinded him and he could not see it. So all of that had to be stripped away. And that's what this is about. So in one day, Job's affliction began. And I'm reading from these scriptures for these next few things. Okay, Job 1.13. Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans, their enemies, attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking on that same day, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And then in 117, while he was still speaking, this is still on the same day, another also came and said the Chaldeans, Babylonians, formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And then that's not all in 118. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. So he lost all of his livestock. It was stolen. He lost the servants that took care of his livestock. They were killed. And then this wind collapsed and killed his ten children, who they were grown children. They were at their brother's house for some kind of gathering. All of them died. And in the midst of all this, Job stood fast. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away kind of attitude. That was fine. But finally, Satan was allowed to afflict Job's body with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. So his friends then came, they heard what had happened to him, and they came to sit with him. And they remained silent for seven days. They were so appalled at his physical appearance and his great pain. And that's from Job 3, 11 and 12. Then one of them began to suggest what sin Job may have committed in order for God to allow this to happen. And Job responded by blaming God. Listen to his words. Job 6.4, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, their poison my spirit drinks. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. God, you're doing this. Well, God had allowed Satan to do it. And you'll, you may say to me, well, somewhere there it says that Satan incited God to do it, but Satan is not greater than God, so he can't stir him up to do it. God simply used Satan as his blacksmith. Blacksmith. Isaiah 54, 16. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work, and I have created the destroyer to ruin. So, if you're wondering, did Satan really incite him? No. So, Job's response, blaming God, Job 6.4. Again, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me, their poison my spirit drinks, the terrors of God are arrayed against me. And then in 7.20, he says, Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? He says to God, Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Lord, you're targeting me. Lord, your terrors are arrayed against me. 
Job 9, 17. For he bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. This is wrong. I haven't done anything to deserve this. And then, in 9.20, though I am righteous, my mouth will condemn me. Though I am guiltless, he will declare me guilty. Well, even though I'm perfect, he's declaring me guilty. So he accused God of attacking him, of poisoning him, though he is righteous and does good things. He accused God of targeting him, his faithful servant? Why are you doing this to me? He accused God of acting, of adding wounds to wounds, making his suffering greater and greater, though he said he had done nothing to deserve that. So God was wrong. Why was God doing this to him? So he continued to blame God. He goes on and on. Job 10, 7, according to your knowledge, that is Job's knowledge of God's law, I am indeed not guilty, yet there is no deliverance from your hand. Look, according to this word, I am not guilty, but you haven't delivered me from these boils. So Job, in trying to judge God and point his finger at God, saying God is wrong, judged himself. He said, I'm not guilty, and God should not do these things to me. He judged God. But he didn't stop there. Job 19, 7 through 11. Behold, I cry, violence! You're doing violence to me, God. But I get no answer. I shout for help, but there is no justice he has walled up my way. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has put darkness on my path. He has stripped my honor from me and removed the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. And he has uprooted my hope like a tree. Verse 11. He has also kindled his anger against me and considered me as his enemy. Oh, if he had considered Job as his enemy, he never would have tested Job, so Job would eventually see the contents of his heart. But he's merciful, and so he did it. He accused God of not answering him. Well, of course the Lord was not going to answer him because he was pointing his finger at God and saying, you are treating me like I'm your enemy. That's not right. It's just continual. Job 23, 4. He said, I would present my case before him. Now he's going to take God to court and say, here I am, righteous, good in every way, doing all kinds of good deeds, go to church every Sunday. So I'm going to take him to court. And I'm going to say, okay. Only problem is God's the judge. Okay, judge, you're doing wrong. <laughs> oh my, don't do that. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say to me. Verse 6 of 23, would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. After all, he's righteous. Verse 7, there the upright would reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Then Job spent all of chapter 29 extolling the wonderful things he had done. It was a hymn of praise to himself. Instead of a hymn of praise to God, he didn't give God glory for any of it. He didn't say, as I always do, I don't do it. He who is in me does it. I'm just a vessel. No, he did all these good things. So, there wasn't a word of repentance in this whole chapter 29 where he's talking about how wonderful he is. So in chapter 32, we begin to get the picture in chapter 32 of what God wants to get at in Job's heart 
and why he is testing him so severely. Now, don't be judging God. He will restore Job when Job repents. So, in 32 of Job, Job's friends gave up. They had suggested every kind of sin, and Job said, no, I am good, I am good, I am good. So they gave up. Their efforts were useless, they found, because he kept standing firm in the fact that he was righteous. He was righteous in his own eyes. Job 32.1. He was righteous in his own eyes. He wasn't righteous in God's eyes. He was upright, all the things God said, but he was not righteous because there was something in him that made it so he condemned God for what God had done to show him his own heart. So God's purpose in Job's affliction is now revealed. He, he trusted in his own righteousness. That's what God wanted to get at in his heart. Therefore, he blamed the Lord for what was happening to him. You're wrong in this, Lord. But the purpose was a merciful purpose because if his heart had remained like that until the day he stood before the Lord to be judged, he would have been condemned. Because he thought he was more righteous than God. I'll show it to you. Beginning with chapter 33, Elihu, a young man who had remained silent while the three friends and Job went back and forth, once they had given up, he spoke. In Job 33, 8 through 10, Surely you have spoken in my hearing, says Elihu, and I have heard the sound of your words. And these are his words, Job's words, that Elihu repeats. I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no guilt in me. Behold, he invents pretexts, that is, charges, against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. So, he's claiming his purity, but he's not pure. And his innocence, but he's not innocent. And the Lord is showing him by what he's allowing to come upon Job. Then Elihu said in 33.12, Behold, let me tell you, you are not right in this. You are not right in this. The one who claimed to be righteous. You are not right in this, for God is greater than man. Now what that means is God knows what he's doing, and you don't always know. So Job accused God because he believed God judged him unfairly. But God is perfect. He never judges unfairly. By his reliance on his own goodness and by his willingness to condemn God for what he was doing to him, he revealed that his heart was not right with God. And Elihu finally put his finger right on it in speaking to Job. Man has no right to judge God because ju God is greater than man. There is nothing greater than God. And what he does, he does for a reason. You may not see it right off. I didn't when I was stricken with MS, when I became so disabled that I could no longer work, and it became progressive. It had started out, you know, I'd have some kind of attack of something, and it would go, and I ne never even knew it was MS. But now I was, it was full assault on me. Nothing else had gotten my attention. So full assault on me. I didn't blame God, though, because in the beginning I didn't even know him. But he had something. He afflicted me because there was something in my heart. I had come to faith during the time I was sick. But there was something in my heart that had I stood before him, he would have condemned me. There's a reason for everything he does. If you are being afflicted, 
If you are having troubles right now, it's for a reason. God has let it happen so that you might see what's in your heart and turn. You remember from Luke twenty-two thirty-one, Jesus' words? He said, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat, Peter. Satan can't do anything without God's permission. And you remember how I said sifting with, like wheat is throwing it up in the air so that all the chaff blows away. So God used Satan as the means for Peter to see his heart was prideful. I will never deny you. He denied him three times, just like Jesus said he would. Then he went off and wept because he saw he was prideful. Ha! See, it's wonderful. Repentance. Ah, that's the purpose. So Elihu continued to challenge Job for blaming God in Job 35 verses 1 and 2. I mean, he gets right to it here. Then Elihu continued and said, do you think this is according to justice, what you're saying about God? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? <laughs> That's exactly what Job thought because he was accusing God of not being righteous toward him. The righteous Job. So he accused God, and that is why the Lord had not yet delivered him. Now, this was only a matter of months that he was ill. But the Lord had not yet delivered him because he was still stubbornly saying, I'm right, God's wrong. I'm right, God's wrong. Do you do that? Oh, afflicted and storm-tossed one then repent. Elihu continued, in God's great mercy, he had not unleashed his anger on Job, and he had not judged Job. Job 35, 13, surely God will not listen to an empty cry. He doesn't hear the prayers of sinners, and Job had something in his heart that was sin, his self-righteousness. Surely God will not listen to an empty cry, nor will the Almighty regard it. How much less when you say, you do not behold him, the case is before him, and you must wait for him. He's waiting for you, Job. Verse 15, and now because he has not visited you in his anger, nor has he acknowledged your transgression well, so Job opens his mouth emptily. He multiplies words without the knowledge. He doesn't understand his own heart yet. And so, God in his mercy had not unleashed his anger and judgment upon him. His great mercy. Job's cries were empty for he railed against the righteous God. He was so sure that he was right and God was wrong that he didn't give up. And he was so sure that he was right and God was wrong that he blamed God for what was happening to him and didn't see what God was trying to get at in his heart through this affliction. Therefore, Job had continued to accuse him and blame him and every other thing, adding further charges. You've treated me like your enemy. All kinds of things. So, <laughs> since God was on trial before Job, Elihu said this in defense of the Lord. He was the Lord's defense attorney, you might say. Job 36.1. Then Elihu continued and said, wait for me a little, and I will show you that there is yet more to be said in God's behalf. Oh, you don't want to be in the situation where you hear from God's defense attorney. And he told Job God's purpose 
which is the same purpose for testing you, beloved, the same purpose for testing me, that we would see our hearts, that we would see our hearts, Job 36, 8. And if they are bound in fetters and are caught in the cords of affliction, verse 9, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions, that is, their sins, and that they have magnified themselves. Magnified. I am wonderful. What are you doing to me? I'm wonderful. Verse 10, he opens their ear to instruction and commands that they return from evil. Ah, it's all about opening your ear to his instruction. He says, there's something in your heart. I want to get to it. You repent. I'll show it to you. So, Elihu then spoke of the reward for repentance and the consequences of refusing to repent. Job 36, 11, if they hear and serve, that would be obey him, they will end their days in prosperity. They will receive his favor and their years in pleasures, their delight. Verse 12, but if they do not hear, if they refuse his instruction and refuse to repent, they shall perish by the sword and they will die without knowledge. They will not know him and they will not know their own hearts, so they would turn and repent. So he shows them their hearts, and they have two choices. Either obey him and live long and prosper, or disobey him, and they will die and be judged. So, well, that still wasn't quite enough to get Job to repent. So the Lord himself spoke to Job. Job had not heard from him. He had simply complained to him up to that point. He asks you, O afflicted one, the same question he asked Job in 38.1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, verse 2, Who is this that darkens, that hides counsel, that hides wisdom? by words without knowledge. Verse 3, now gird up your loins like a man. That's what you usually say when someone's about to go into battle. Gird up your loins. And I will ask you, Job, and you instruct me. Ha, wow. So he showed Job that his foolish words that he had spoken without any knowledge of what was in his heart or any knowledge of the reason God was doing this, his foolish words revealed that wisdom was hidden from him. He had no wisdom, despite all that he said about himself. He was too busy blaming God to see what God was trying to get at in his heart. So <laughs> he challenged him to a battle. God's wisdom versus Job's foolishness. The Lord drove his truth home to Job and to you with these questions. Job 40, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty, with God Almighty? Will you contend with me? Will you find fault with me? Let him who reproves, that is, convicts God, Answer it. Okay, answer this one, Job. Who do you think you are to contend with me? Blame me. I am Almighty God. You are not God. You don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. You're still not getting it. So, at those words, let him who reproves God answer it. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? You're finding fault with me, Almighty God? Okay, go ahead and answer. And at those words, <laughs> Job stopped blaming God. And Job said this in Job 40, verses 3 through 5. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. Ooh, that's good. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. 
I'm not going to speak against you anymore. Once I have spoken, and I will not answer, even twice, and I will add nothing more. I'm not going to say anything about you anymore. God, you have my attention. But the Lord continued to question him, for Job had not yet repented. He put his hand on his mouth. He wasn't going to say any more, but he still hadn't repented for what was in his heart. So God said this, 48, 40, verse 8. Will you really annul, that is, make void, cancel out my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? God is perfect. You can't condemn him for what he's doing. But Job wanted everybody to say, okay, we're in court. Job is right. God is wrong. Job had found fault with the Almighty. He convicted God of unfairly judging him. Thus he had judged himself because he was blinded by his own self-righteousness. I'm good. I do good things. Look, everybody loves me. So the answers would be very obvious for the questions that the Lord next said, the challenge. 40, verse 12 and 13. Hey, Job, look on everyone who is proud and humble them and tread down the wicked where they stand. Then I, God, will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. <gasps> oh, See, my righteousness is greater than God's. Therefore, my own righteousness can save me. Do you see it? You're wrong, God. That's self-righteousness in a nutshell. Only God can judge and save. Only he can look at those who are proud and humble them just as he was doing with Job right then. He is the only one who can tread down the wicked, that is, judge them for what they've done. He, he says to Job, oh, if you can do that, okay, then your own right hand, your own self-righteousness can save you. Strong words? That was what it took to finally shake Job out of his slumber so he could see what was in his heart. Job finally saw that he had trusted in his own self-righteousness. How much more explicit could the Lord get? My goodness. So what did he do next? Job 42.1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, A, a fact. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Well, the good part of that was he finally saw that God had a purpose in allowing him to be afflicted. But there was no repentance in that. That was just a statement of fact. Oh, I realize you're afflicting me for a purpose. But he hadn't repented. Then he started repeating what God had said to him. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? And then Job responds, Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful, that is too high for me, which I did not know. And in verse 4, God said this, Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. So Job was hearing again the words the Lord had spoken to him to try to shake him out of his self-righteousness, to open his eyes that had been blinded by it. Then Job finally repented. Glory to God, 42, 5, and 6. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Finally, he had heard of God. And he did all the things of the law of Moses. He, you know, didn't disobey the law of Moses, but he trusted in that. And God needed to get at that. Because he was trusting in his own ability to be good. 
I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Oh, now I see you. Oh, my goodness, look at what I have done. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Back then, if you were mourning for what you had done or for a death or anything, you would throw dust up into the air and cover yourself with ashes as a sign of mourning. So he was like repenting to the max. Wonderful. He had heard of the Lord, but he didn't know him. If he knew him, he would never have blamed him for what was going on to him. God always has a purpose in everything. Now he saw the Lord. He saw God's character. God himself had spoken to him, and that finally made him shut up and repent. All of this happened so that Job would understand that he trusted in his own righteousness instead of God's. If he had trusted in God's, he would say, God, you have a purpose. That's great. You'll show it to me. But if you trust in your own righteousness, you will surely blame God. Now, I have no righteousness. It's no wonder I didn't blame him when I had MS. I mean, I had no righteousness. I blamed the world for punishing me for being a disabled person because, boy, they sure do. I found that out when I became disabled. But you, oh, churchgoer, I have heard many of you in my years as a pastor, blaming God for what's going on in your life. Therefore, you are trusting in your own righteousness. I hope that you see it through the word of God today. That is the purpose of this. So after Job repented, this was interesting. You know, his three friends had been with him, throwing out all these possible sins that Job must have done in order to deserve this terrible affliction. The Lord said, you've got to pray for me to forgive your friends because they haven't spoken rightly of me. Because it wasn't about outward sins. It was about the condition of his heart. They missed it completely. And so when he prayed, the Lord forgave them and he restored Job twofold. He had twice as many flocks, twice as many servants, and he had another 10 children. Well, shouldn't he have had 20 children? You know, restoring twice as much? No. Where were the other 10? Well, in those days, in Abraham's bosom, awaiting the time when Jesus Christ died, rose, ascended, was glorified, and opened heaven. Then they were taken there. That's where his other 10 were. So they weren't gone. They were gone from his sight, but they weren't gone. You see, all of this, all of this that looked so bad was for Job's own good. And when Job repented and then prayed for his friends who had said wrong things about God, who had not properly judged what was going on, who had been of no help at all to Job, he forgave them after he had repented, and it was then that God released this wonderful blessing of twice as much. God did not do that until he prayed for God to forgive them. Why? If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. Matthew 6.15, Jesus Christ's own words. So he needed to Forgive them for all the stuff they threw at him before God would release his blessing into Job's life again. Glory to God. First he had to repent, then he had to pray for the people who had slung dirt at him. So, I tell you the truth. Do not look at God and shake your fist at him. If you are afflicted, look at the Lord and say, show me what is in my heart. There's something you're trying to get at. And he will. 
Do you know what he showed me that released the ability for me to be healed? He would not heal me until I saw this that was in my heart. Unforgiveness toward my first husband, the drug dealer, who beat me within an inch of my life. Really, I bled internally. I didn't know I even had that in there still, but it was there, and he knew it, and he was going to bring it out. So when, his, when my pastor said, two things you need to go be- do before I'll even show you that he still heals, are these. First, go to him, pray, ask him if you're right with him. I did, no answer. Told Pastor Doc, no answer. He said, is there any unforgiveness in your heart? And immediately the Holy Spirit brought up husband number one. And he said, you've got to take that to God. I won't even work with you until you have. So that very night, I went before the Lord. I mean, I was a baby Christian. I didn't have it in me to forgive him. And I told the Lord that. I said, Lord, I I know it's in there. I know it stands between you and me. And I want to know you intimately. So, Lord, will you take it from me? And I felt it come off my shoulders. And that was what set in motion for me to be healed in the middle of the night, September 1st into September 2nd, we hours, by Jesus Christ. I had to forgive something that was buried deep in my heart in order to be healed. And then he further healed me two months later by completely cleansing my heart, purifying it, crucifying my sin nature, and filling me with himself, Jesus did, and the Father and the Spirit, so that I didn't depend on my own righteousness. I don't depend on my own righteousness, but on his righteousness, the righteous one who made me righteous on the inside when he cleaned me up on the inside and came in to permanently dwell there. He's righteous. Therefore, I am only because of him. I mean, people say, you know, oh, that was a good job or that was a good sermon or or, thank you for this or thank you for that. I said, thank God, because I'm just a vessel. He's the one who deserves all praise because he's the one who's working and speaking through me to you even today so that you would see the condition of your heart and repent. He would surely release you from your affliction, which he has allowed if you would do that. So you are storm-tossed you are afflicted. If you have said the kinds of words to God that Job did, repent. You have found fault with the Almighty, the one perfect God of heaven. I pray you would do it right this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers